All right, fam, let's have a real conversation today. The American people are not investing enough money for retirement. I don't want to hear you don't make enough money to invest. Respectfully, shut up. And I be hearing all these excuses from people. Oh, man, I don't make enough money. Be quiet. Make some more money. Oh, man, I got kids. I don't care how many kids you got. Figure out a way to how we can, how can we save and how can we invest? Oh, I want my family to live in a nice neighborhood. They can live in a nice neighborhood, but do you need a five-bedroom in a nice neighborhood? Why are you spending so much money on your kids and you're not investing into your future? I got money to where I can go out there and build my dream home right now. I can do it. I was about to do it. But let me tell you what I want more than a banging house. Let me tell you what more than I want than a banging car. Let me tell you what I want more than bragging rights. I want true financial freedom. So when I do hit 65 years old, I am able to do what I want to do. Now that was your sign to get your retirement affairs in order. But wait, before we hop into today's show, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Now let's jump into the video. Hey, yo. Welcome to the table. Yeah, yeah. We gon' get real. We gon' get right. Oh, building up wealth. We gon' give life. Welcome to the table. Wealth. Yeah. Welcome to the table. Build wealth. Life. Welcome to the table. All right, fam, let's have a real conversation today. Let's, let's, I want you to dial in. I want you to listen. Turn up your speakers in your car. Turn up YouTube. Because a recent study came out and it kind of frustrated me and it kind of scared me a little bit. And the, the study is pretty much saying that the American people are not investing enough money for retirement. AKA, when we were young, when we were in our 30s, when we were in our 20s, we came up with so many excuses. Well, I'm gonna wait till next month. I'm gonna wait till next year. I'm gonna wait till this time. And we never took the time to think about what are we gonna do for our families? What are we gonna do for our spouses? And what are we gonna do for our kids? Our kids. I wanna start off today's show by asking you a very real question that I need you to be honest with when it comes to yourself. Are you saving enough money for your 65, 70, 75 year old self when it's time for you to retire? I don't wanna hear you don't make enough money to invest. Respectfully, shut up. I, I don't wanna hear what well, I'm gonna start next year. Respectfully, start now, shut up. Um, because when I read this study, and I'm gonna put this study in the show notes so y'all don't think that I'm capping or I'm making up these numbers, but the average senior citizen spends $4,345 a month, but 75% of their cash is swallowed up by four main things. So 75% of their money is already spent on four basic life things. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, BLS, the average citizen aged 65 and over earns a pre-tax income, watch this, of $55,335 a year and spends $52,141 of it per year. Watch this. This is pre-taxed. According to the BLS, Bureau of Labor Statistics, not according to Anthony O'Neill, not according to, you know, some made up numbers. No, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the average citizen at the age of 65, at the age of when people are normally retiring and over, make about $55,000 a year, and they spend approximately $52,000 on bills. Not, not, not on anything that they want to enjoy and do, they spend it on mandatory bills. Let's break it down some more. Per this study, it means that their expenses amount to $4,345 a month. And more than three quarters of that is swallowed up by four key areas. What do you think these areas are? It's what I teach about all the time. Housing, transportation, health care, and food. They spend $4,300 a month on basic stuff. 
and they have less than 25% of their money to enjoy. We, 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 we've, we've worked all these years. We've, we've worked all these years and we only get to enjoy 25% of it. And I'd be hearing all these excuses from people. Oh man, I don't make enough money. Be quiet. Make some more money. Oh man, I got kids. I don't care how many kids you got. Figure out a way to how we can, how can we save and how can we invest? Now, let me be nice because I mean, I, 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 I want to be understanding and I don't want to be mean or rude, but here's what I am saying. It's like, y'all, we have to stop making excuses because one day we will be a part of this study. We will be a part of the statistics because we allowed our excuses. We allowed um, current circumstances. Watch this, that we were not willing to change. We were not willing to be uncomfortable. We were not willing to be a mom, to be a father and tell our kids, no, you can't be a part of this particular program because it's going to cost us a lot of money. And I cannot afford to do that because I want to set you up to win in the future. Well, what do you mean by that, Anthony? Why are you spending so much money on your kids and you're not investing into your future. You're not investing into your 401k. You're not investing into a Roth IRA. You're not investing into a traditional IRA. You're not investing into an HSA. You're not investing into a mortgage. You're not investing into any land. You're not investing into a business. You're not investing into yourself, but you got your kids looking real dope. They got on the Jordans. They got on all the nice stuff. They got this, but you ain't got no money to invest. Your kids only know daggone Jordans. What they need is freedom. What they need is, is a time to really enjoy you when you get older. Do not be a burden to your kids because you were so passionate about them looking good. Why in the world does a three-year-old have on Jordans when they don't even know they got on Jordans? Yeah, I ain't got no kids. And y'all gonna be in the chapel. You ain't got no kids. You don't understand. You're right, but when I got kids, when I get kids, I don't care. I'm not saying they would never have some Jordans, but what I'm not going to do is spend money over here and rob from my future. Because if I rob from my future, if I'm struggling like this today, in the future, who's gonna help me? My kids. Now I'm a burden to my kids. Now I'm taking away money from my kids' family. Why? Because I was not wise to steward my season correctly. I often get questions about life insurance, where to buy, how to find affordable rates, the simplest application process, and most importantly, where to secure coverage instantly. Like people don't want to wait a long time. They want the coverage right now. Given the startling statistic that nearly 40% of African Americans do not have life insurance coverage today, it's even more critical to address these questions. My recommendation to all these questions is simple. My friends over at Ethos Life Insurance. These are the people who hold my life insurance policy. You see, their mission is to simplify life insurance and make it accessible online to everyone. No paperwork, no medical exams, or check this out, no blood tests. You simply answer some health questions online and just like that, you can secure coverage the exact same day. But the cherry on the top, family, Ethos offers an incredible deal that I wish I had when I signed up with them for my life insurance policy about two years ago. You see, when you secure a life insurance policy through them, they will throw in a will and estate plan for 100% free. <laughs> I, I'm tripping and I'm excited at the same time because I personally spent $2,500 on my estate plan at the beginning of this year. So getting it free with a life insurance policy that might cost you as low as $50, that's a no brainer. I mean, like none. Don't just take my word for it. You see, Tanner R., a customer, uh, secured a $500,000 30-year policy without a physical exam through Ethos. He says the price was great. The process was completely easy. You see, Ethos truly values our time. You see, Alex got approved for a $1 million uh, policy in just five minutes. She said, simple and straight to the point. Comments were surprisingly user friendly and great communication. So, are you ready to protect your family's financial future? Don't let this statistic define you. 
I want you to get covered today and get a will and get the life insurance policy and get the, uh, um, the, the what's it called? The uh, estate plan for 100% free. All you got to do is go to anthonyoneal.com forward slash ethos. Again, that is anthonyoneal.com forward slash ethos. Secure your coverage today and ensure peace of mind for your loved ones. All right, let's get back to today's show. I was not wise to spend time while I'm in my 30s, while I'm in my 20s, while I'm in my 40s and steward my money well. I don't care if you can only put a, put away $100. Put away $100. I don't care. I don't care. Because the last thing I want to do is have $55,000 to my name when I turn 65, 70 years old. And the majority of that is going to me just living, not to me being able to travel around the world and enjoy my family. Let's, let's, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Um, a recent study by Northwestern Mutual found that the average worker has only $89,300 saved for retirement. A figure that would just cover this figure, $89,000 would just cover over a year of expenses. So if 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 they're spending, if they're at, if they're they're getting fifty five thousand dollars, you know, a year. So eighty nine thousand dollars is really just a little over a year of what they have. So they have some level of income coming in, but they got eighty nine thousand dollars saved for retirement. This, this is ridiculous. This is here's here's what I'm seeing when I read this study, and the reason why I want to talk about it on my show today is because I'm going to give us some practical things, some practical um, tips on how we can make sure we're not a part of this stat. This is scary, you guys. If your retirement only $89,000, $300 in your savings account, that means you were not being a good steward over your finances in your 20s, in your 30s, in your 40s, in your 50s. I'm going to say it. No. But I guarantee you, if, 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 if I look at some of you all right now, you're living in a big old home. It's just you and it's just you and your spouse. You got a big old four thousand square foot home. It's just you and one kid, and you got a five bedroom house. Why? Oh, I want my family to live in a nice neighborhood. They can live in a nice neighborhood, but do you need a five bedroom in a nice neighborhood? Why well, I need time? I need space for my family to come over. Okay, they coming to live or they coming to visit. So you're gonna buy all that space for a weekend for a week? No. No, I refuse to only have $89,000 in my name when I go to retirement. I refuse to do it. I'm, I'm so passionate about this message, you guys. I pay for my entire team, even, even some of my contractors, uh, to sit down with my financial advisor. Because I told them, I said, I don't think even some of y'all are doing the right things with your money. And my thing is to make sure that you are properly investing into your future, that you are properly setting aside for emergencies. Because I know if I sometimes have to check myself, I know y'all got to be checked. Because the last thing I want is anybody who's connected to me struggling at 65, 70 years old. I don't want you watching my content for years and, and you did not take into account on how we can best do it. And we're going to talk about it today. I'm taking my time on today's show. I'm telling you this right now. Because this Northwestern Mutual uh, study is completely scary to me. $89,000 in retirement? Don't put it in the chat. Don't even say it out loud. But I was thinking about this. If you're in your 40s, you should already have over six figures in your retirement account. Uh-oh. Let me be quiet. Let me be quiet. But also, let me say this too, though. If you're watching this and you're not in a place where you have been investing into your retirement, now is the best time to start. It's never too late. It's never too late. I'm going to keep it a buck with you. I'm going to tell you what's on my heart. I'm going to tell you what's on my mind. Yes, you should be there. Yes, let me be real with you about myself. I have a lot in my retirement in my retirement situation, right? In my wealth portfolio. I call it my wealth portfolio. Um, and to be honest with you, I should be a lot further than where I am today. But I didn't steward my 20s well. 
I didn't really start investing until I was like 28, 29 years old. Then I didn't really go in and really take it serious until about like 33. Now I'm even taking it up a whole nother notch today because watch this. It's just me. I got money to where I can go out there and build my dream home right now. I, I can do it. I can do it. I was about to do it. But then one of my mentors said, why? It's just you and a dog right now. Why? I said, well, man, I, I, was trying to, I was trying to do something to where, you know, I may have something dope. I got the money. You know what I'm saying? I can do with it. I can live with it. You know what I'm saying? If I go out there and do this and I can start my family there. He was like, Anthony, you live in a 5,000 square foot situation right now. You can get married. You don't need nothing new even when you get married. Y'all won't need nothing new until maybe you have my, a kid or two. Why go out there and get all this money robbed from your future? Why are you not investing it back into your business? Why are you not investing into your future? Why are you not setting money aside for your kids? Why, are you, why do we want to spend all of our money right now? We get all the real nice and fancy stuff. He said, man, invest into that home, pay off that home, stack your bread, live way below your means. I said, man, I'm the youngest one in my neighborhood. You know what I'm saying? I, I'm going to be around some more thriving young people. He said, boy, he said, okay, you the money guy. Go ahead. And during my sabbatical in July, I really realized that he was honestly correct. Like, I didn't buy the property. I actually got backed out of the deal because he was absolutely right. And I said, why? Why, Anthony? You got a beautiful home. You can build it up, put some more money into it. Maybe put a pool in the backyard because I like to swim. And then pay off the home. So that way, when I get 65, 70, or whenever it is time for me to move, I got great equity in this house. I can sell it and go pay cash for the next one. But when I get 65, 70 years old, I spent money. I was maximizing my time and I made an investment. And I've been investing a whole lot more. A whole lot more because I want to make sure I'm not a burden to my my kids and their families when I get older. And I want to make sure that I'm not giving myself excuses. So let me go back to this study. Let's go back to this study. Um, where are we at right here? Okay, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Yeah, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Um, here's even here's an even more concerning concerning stat, right? Um, there's a separate research by the National Institute of Retirement Security, the NIRS, National Institute on Retirement uh, Security, shows that a standard Generation X household, so this is going to be in between the ages of 43 and 55, have just $40,000 in their retirement pot. That is scary. I mean, it's right now, right now. If you're between 43 and 58, this means that you only have about the average Right, the average Generation X, ages 43 through 58, that's four years older than me, wow. Um, that is right around my parents' age, wow. Only have $40,000 in their retirement pot. This is despite the fact that some are less than two years away from being able to withdraw from their 401ks. And so the average American over the age of 65 reveals their biggest expenses in, is in housing. So, 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 so what I'm seeing from this study is, right, that is they, they have $40,000 in their retirement pot if they're 43 to 58. Uh, the average uh, person is graduating once they hit 65 has about $89,000 in their retirement account. And the biggest expense once they get to the 62, 65 um, age bracket is their housing. It's their housing expense. Okay. So uh, they're saying the vast majority of people will be given the average retirement age of 62. So they're saying right around 62, that's when people are starting to retire and their number one expense comes in at their housing, okay? Housing. So the study is showing that individuals in this group, in this group, right, in this group of 62 year olds, they're paying about $18,872 in housing costs per year, per year, right? Either they rent or they have mortgage payments. And this equates to about $1,500, $1,600 a month or 36% of their average outgoings, right? 
And here's the truth. A $1,500 mortgage or rent in today's day and time is honestly not a bad thing. I'm not even tripping about that. Not at all. I'm not upset about, about you know, spending $1,500 a month um, on their on their housing um, expenses. That's not a bad thing, especially today with interest rates up and inflation going up. That's not a bad thing. Uh, here's the second biggest expense, their transportation, which has, is right around about $7,106 per year, which is about 13%. Um, so if we're at 7,000, I mean, I'm thinking this is either gonna be bus transportations or car notes. So they're still having some level of car notes and they gotta pay some level of insurance. Their insurance would be low, right around 62 to 65, uh, because they've been driving for so long, shouldn't have too many accidents. So these are either um, uh, public transportation um, or car notes. The third biggest expense is going to be the health care, which is um, about $7,000 a year. That's on average. Now, I do know for a fact that I know there are some older people who are spending way more than $7,000 a year on their health insurance. Heck, some of them are just spending seven to $10,000 just on their prescriptions, not on their hospital visits. Okay? And then the fourth biggest expense is food spending about $6,500 uh, for food expenses uh, throughout um, their, a year throughout their retirements. And you guys, this is a little scary uh, to me when I read this, this article. And I'm gonna link this article so y'all can go see it for yourself. Uh, but I, the last thing I wanna point out from this article and then really give you all some practical things on what can we do to really avoid uh, being a part of this stat um, the pandemic shook up 70% of Americans' retirement plans. 71% of those who had a very difficult pandemic experience now plan to retire later in life. 71% of people who, who experienced pandemic in a rough way are now saying, hey, I'm going to I'm going to go past 62. I'm going to go past 65. I may retire at 70, 75 because they had a bad pandemic experience. And I totally understand that. I'm not here to sit here and be like, you know, like, man, uh, I, I get it. I want to help you. I want to help you. I, 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 I want to help you. So the main four things that, that are hurting this generation when it comes to, not this generation, but all of us when it comes to retirement, not really hurting, is our housing, health, transportation, and food. Here's the very first thing I want to talk about. I want to, I want to say this, right, is before, as we look at this, the very first thing that I'm seeing on this article is we need to produce more income. We need to generate more income coming into our families and lower expenses because that's margin is where wealth is truly built. When we can have margin, when we can have margin to invest, margin to flip, margin uh, to just sit there and to get that compound interest, that's where true wealth is built. True wealth is not built because you're out here doing a get rich quick scheme. No, no, no. True wealth is built when you can start a legit business that you're passionate about. True wealth is built when you're properly investing into things. True wealth is built when you're willing to be uncomfortable for a season so you can be comfortable for the rest of your life. And when I look at this article, I like I, I think I said this earlier, I may, may, may not have, um, you know, I'm not really in the market to retire at 65. Um, but when, 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 I, when I hear and when I see this article, what I'm sensing, what I'm seeing is we have to get into a, we have to get to a point to where we can stop exchanging our time for money. Stop exchanging your time just to pay bills. H how can we position ourselves to where we're thinking about our future, to where we are putting ourselves in a, in a position in the next 20, 30 years when we get older, to where we have we now have the option if we want to stop working for the rest of our life and live off of compound interest, or do we want to continue working and we still live off of the compound interest, but maybe we're not working as hard. You know, my friend and Dave, uh, my friend Dave Ramsey is preparing to uh, um, transition and leave the company with his his children. Um, while I think, and I could be dead wrong, but while I was there for the six, seven years I was there, I think Dave um, um, will turn the company over for his son to run the company. But I still think that man will come in and do that show, do the Ramsey show, because I think that's that's his gift, that's his passion. 
I've watched that man get on that show sick. I've watched that man um, pass up speaking engagements so he wouldn't miss that show. What am I saying? He loves what he's doing. So he's positioning himself to where he doesn't have to work hard. He can pass it down to his kids and to his family and be a blessing to his kids and his family. But then he'll still come in and do the show for three, four hours a day, maybe. Maybe not every single day, but he'll come in and do it two, at two days, three days. I don't know. I don't know his schedule, but here's what I'm saying. is like he's positioning himself to do what he wants to do, when he wants to do it, however he wants to do it. And that's what it's all about. How are we stewarding this healthy season that we're in right now to position ourselves to when we get to that age, if we want to stop working, we can stop working. But if we want to keep working, we want to keep going, maybe we could do it differently, but we don't have to show up so we can get money. We don't have to exchange our time simply for money. What are you doing right now? A lot of you say, I need more money. Okay, cool, great. Maybe you do need more money. And I agree. The more money we have that is legal, legit, um, and, and is fulfilling our purpose, let's do it. But I think a lot of us right now is not the money. It's not the money. It's how are we stewarding, how are we budgeting what we have? I remember making $40,000 a year saying, I need more money. I remember. But now when I look at it, I didn't really need more money. I could have used more money for sure, but during that season in my life, my biggest issue wasn't the income. It was how was I stewarding the 90%, actually, let's be real, I wasn't tithing back then. How was I stewarding the 100% that I have? I wasn't stewarding that well. I wasn't tithing, so my money really wasn't getting touched. It wasn't really blessed. I was being selfish, keeping it off me because I'd rather pay my bills. I didn't want to step out on faith and trust God that if I give him that 10%, he probably would have gave me, he probably would have got me a pay raise. He probably would have got me, uh, I don't know, whatever, to bring in more money. I thought I could do better with the 10%. So I kept it. I didn't want to go out there and get an extra job when I was youth pastoring and only making like $38,000, $40,000 a year. Hey, let's be real. My very first job was $28,000 a year. Then I jumped up to $38,000. But the biggest issue, you guys, wasn't that it wasn't really the income. It was I really wasn't maximizing. OK, so I want to break this down based upon these four things that we see here that is hurting people to really help us. This goes down to the basics, right? This goes down to the very basics. No, I'm not going to teach you how to go out there and take $100 and flip it and make $100 million. No, no, no. I'm not going to teach you how to make a $1 million in the next 90 days. I'm not going to guarantee you $100,000 in the next 90 days. I ain't doing that. I'm not doing that. Is it possible? Heck yeah. I've done it, right? But I think we skip over the basics and we skip over really, really having the opportunity to do the right things first. I am going back to the basics because I want to make sure that as I'm building, I'm building on the basics, a solid foundation. So let's talk about housing, right? Because your roof is your number one priority. Having shelter, having a roof over your head, over your family's head is the number one responsibility you need to be taken care of. But I got to ask you this question, but is it worth you considering are you in the right house? Are you? Are you? I remember talking to a friend right around my age, and he went out there and bought a close to like, it was a four bedroom with a, with a, with a bonus room that he was going to use for his office, but he turned it into a, um extra bedroom. And um, it was about close to about like 34, 3,200 square feet, just him, his wife, and um, a one-year-old. Um, I think she's one. I think she's one. Yeah, I think she is one. Uh, so she's like one or two. And and I asked him, I said, man, why are you buying this much house? Like, why, bro? He's like, man, because, you know, my wife, she she loves the neighborhood. Um, and, you know, my wife, you know, we just want to have something nice, man, you know. And uh, we want to have, we want to have some room for when people come to visit, they can stay with us. I said, okay, so you're going to pay an extra hundred, two hundred thousand dollars just to tell your family and friends whenever they come in town, what, maybe once or twice a year that they can stay with you? Rather than 
tell them to get a hotel room or maybe maybe you you if you're so passionate about helping people how about you just spend some money and put them in a hotel room well, why are you going to spend an extra 200 grand plus interest on top of the 200 grand just so that you and you and your wife can say we have extra rooms one of my good friends are the minimalists and they're like why do we have extra rooms why are we not utilizing every single room so like they're really minimalist so they have a one bedroom with a living room like man, why are you? Why do you have four bedrooms? Like, are, are are we even utilizing the space? And, and it, it is a question. I'm not saying you need to go down to a one bedroom. Here's what I'm saying: is are you stretching yourself past the 25 to 30 percent margin of what you should be paying on your mortgage um, because you want to be impressive to others, um, or because you want to look like you're walking into something when you pull up? Some of you in your 50s watching me right now. Why are you still in the same home that you raised your kids in? How come you haven't downsized yet? Well, why, how come you haven't, you know, maybe moved into a townhome that you don't have to cut the grass? Well, wh wh why are you single and you staying in a, you know, three, four thousand dollar apartment? Let me tell y'all, man. Let me tell y'all, man. I mean, let me tell you. Let me tell you, man. I I'm telling you right now. If y'all, <laughs> man, I remember when I first started making my money, man. I stayed in a in a, in a small one bedroom apartment, making about you know close to twenty thousand dollars a month. I think my rent was like eleven fifty, and I felt good. I wish I could still be there right now. I didn't have no grass to cut. I didn't I didn't have to worry about no 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 nothing. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's like it's like just because I was making that money, I didn't jump out there and go build it. Then the very first house that I bought because I really wanted to be for myself below 20% of my take home pay, right? I went I drove all the way out to Columbia, Tennessee. Columbia, Tennessee, boy, I'm trying to tell you, it's Mule City. I think it was only maybe 2% black people. Um it really it was it was just very very country, very country. It's about maybe 30, 45 minutes outside of Nashville. At that time, it was about a 20 minute drive um, into the office there in Franklin, Tennessee. And everyone's like, why are you going way out there? I said, man, because, you know, I I did want a lot of house, but I want to make sure if I, if I want a lot of house, I'm going to drive out somewhere that's going to give me the best bang for the buck. So the first house that I built was like only $300,000. Um, it was a, what, one, two, three, three bedroom. And... One of those I used for my, my office, other one was a guest bedroom. Then I had a theater room, right? And I think my my mortgage payment, like I said, it was like twelve. No, 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 no. My mortgage payment on that one was about like, yeah, it was about twelve fifty. Uh twelve fifty, twelve hundred fifty dollars. And I mean, it was so beautiful. Big front yard, big backyard. Some of y'all, if you've been following me for a while, you saw the house that I sold um in Columbia. And what am I saying? I wanted to make sure that my my mortgage that my living expenses when it comes to my mortgage or my rent was below the 30%. Some of y'all saying, Anthony, with inflation today, that's gonna be hard. Well, no, 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 I, I really wanna be honest with you. It, it's not hard, it's just that you don't like where you will have to live. And you're not willing to be uncomfortable a little bit so that one day you can get to where you really, really, really want to be. I want to be on the water or on the golf course today. My money can afford it, but it doesn't make sense for me to do that when it's just me and a dog. I cannot financially say this is a wise decision. I want to be on a golf course. I want to wake up on a Saturday instead of getting in my car and putting my golf clubs in the back of the car. I want to put them on a cart and drive off to the first hole. That's what I want to do. And my bag can do that. But I refuse to do that because it doesn't make sense. It's not a good tax play. It doesn't make sense for me to drop that much money. I spend that much money. What if my wife don't like the house? Then I got to move. 
So I'm, I'm, I'm keeping my behind in a place that is comfortable for me. And listen, y'all, when I pull up to my friends' houses and my friends' um, um, stuff, man, I'm like, yo, dude, I can't wait to get this, boy. Oh, man. Oh, we, we, we shot something for the Neatness Network, and as soon as we pulled into the neighborhood, everyone who knows me is like, yo, bro, you see that house up front? I was like, yes. It was like, bro, that's you, right? And I was like, yes, that's the kind of house I want. But let me tell you what I want more than a banging house. Let me tell you what more than I want than a banging car. Let me tell you what I want more than bragging rights. I want true financial freedom. So when I do hit 65 years old, I am able to do what I want to do. And if I want to, quote unquote, retire and not work again, I want to be in a position to where I can do that. And it doesn't cost my kids and it doesn't impact my kids. Because when I was 39 years old, about to hit 40, I didn't go buy a big old house. I stayed where I was. I invested into this house. I made it bit, bit better and I invested into my future. So the practical thing right now, you guys, is for you not to hit this stat, you have to make sure that you're not spending no more than 30% on, of your net income onto your mortgage. So let's say for right now, if the average person in America, let's just say, let's just, let's just say 48,000, 48,000 is what you're making, right? Times that by 30%, that means, oh, I'm sorry, uh, if it's 48,000, divided that into 12, that's 4,000, divide that that times that by 30%. That means that your rent or mortgage payment should not be more than $1,200. Let's say some of y'all right now are making $100,000 a year because we got some people um, in my bracket that is doing well, you know, and you times that by 30%. Hold on, 8,333 times that by 30%. That means your mortgage payment rent payment should not be no more than $2,499. $2,400, that's about $2,500. You can't sit here and tell me you can't find rent less than $2,500. You can't sit here and tell me that you can't find a mortgage less than $2,500. I got I got rental properties that my mortgage payment is cheaper than that. Are they in the most up-to-date, the nicest, like, oh my God, the right, the white picket fence and the nice trees? and, and not, No, they're not. I'm going to be honest with you. They're not. But what do you want more? Do you want financial freedom more? Or do you want bragging rights while you while, while uh, during this time, and then you want to be struggling when you're 65 and you have no more money coming in? So I'm going to tell you right now: if you're in a home, if you're in a mortgage that is above 30 percent of your income, it will be worth to talk to a professional. It will be worth to you, for you to talk to a real estate agent and see about downsizing into a better home. Interest rates are high. So that's what I'm saying. I would sit down with a professional, sit down with a real estate agent, talk to a banker and say, you know what? I want to get my mortgage down to 35%. I can't do that in this house. Is Can I sell this house, take that money that I, I make from selling the house, put that down on the next house, and with this interest rate, can I still get it below 30% of my take-home pay? That's a yes or a no question. And if they say, well, hey, based upon an interest payment today, this is your best route, then you need to stay right there. But uh, what I'm going to tell you is marry the home, date the rate. So, so if you could find, if, 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 if this home is the best opportunity right now, marry that. As soon as the rates go lower, revisit the conversation. Should I sell? Should I refi? And can I get my mortgage payment below? But you got to talk to a banker. You need to talk to a real estate agent to see what can you sell your house for? What can you do? Watch this. Some of y'all are renting and your lease is about to be up. But you really like that apartment. You, It's nice. You got a high rise. Oh, it's nice. It's nice. You got a nice little high rise. You got a pool in there. You got a two-story gym. Oh, it's nice. But it's costing you too much money. I'm not saying go somewhere that is unsafe. Here's what I'm saying. You got to stop complaining and saying you can't win. Here's the second biggest expense um, for once we get to 65, and that is our transportation, okay? Okay. If you have an auto loan and you're paying interest on it, it's a depreciating asset. 
I have two vehicles. Um, one of them was a tax plate. It's, it's in a business name. The other one is in a, uh, my Bentley. I told you all I had the Bentley before. Um, that's that's my personal toy that I purchased um, about a year and some change ago and uh, paid cash for both of them. One of them was a huge tax write-off um, because I was able to get something over 6,000 pounds last year and we was able to write it off 100% uh, based upon you know the tax strategy that my CPA gives me. Right. But I don't I don't I don't I don't borrow money for cars. Now, watch this. Because I paid cash for them, because they are now uh, there's no debt on it. I have the titles, you know, myself in the safe at the bank. Um, now it's somewhat of an asset. It's still depreciating a little bit in value. Right. But it now is an asset because there's no debt on it. So I could take both of my cars and sell it and get a lot of money for both of them if life was to happen. But when you have debt on it, right now they're saying the average car note is right around like 600 bucks. And then an average brand new car, if you're buying brand new cars, like a Mercedes, a ben, uh, not a Bentley, like a Mercedes, a BMW, you know, they're ranging anywhere between a thousand and $1,300. I just saw a video the other day where this guy walked around his office, co-workers and said, hey, how much is your car note? 1,300. Hey, how much is your car note? 1,200. Hey, how much is your car note? Um, 1150 and I'm sitting there bro I I I had a small panic attack for these people because I'm like man you are paying 13 plus thousand dollars a year for a vehicle that is losing value one of my homegirls uh, she called me and she said hey I know you don't do debt uh, but I'm just asking you from a deal perspective because I do not have cash I do not have cash like AO to go purchase a car. And she wanted to go purchase a very high-end car. A very it, it, This is above your BMW and Mercedes. It's a very high-end car. And when she told me the car note would be $1,370 a month on this high-end car, that is a 2017. I literally almost cussed her out. I had to catch myself. I wouldn't be like, you dumb. <laughs> you spend that much money on a car. You are crazy as big. And so I had to catch myself because she, she, you know, that's my sister. I love her. I said, yo, no, ma'am. I don't, no, ma'am. Listen, you you see my cars. I'm not spending that much money for my cars. If I if I was a finance of uh, the Bentley, that would have been like a three to $4,000 a month car, car note. No. And I couldn't see myself doing that, putting miles on the car and it's depreciating. And if I ever did want to trade it in, then I, I'm not going to be, I don't have, I don't have nothing. I don't paid all the money extra on the interest. So it's like, I have an advantage now because I didn't pay any interest on the car. If the car was worth X amount of dollars, I paid below X amount of dollars. Please believe me. I walked away from both of my cars at first. I was like, no, nah, I'm good. If you have it listed for X amount, I want it less than X amount. And if they weren't budging on less than X amount, I just walked away. And I walked away on both of them. And both of them called me back at the last week of the month. I think one of them called me back the last two days of the month. and said, hey, Mr. Neal, you still in the market for the XYZ? I said, yes, sir. I'm still in the market for the car. He was like, uh... Yeah, we can give you this. I said, no, sir. That was an offer I offered you two weeks ago. Now for me to come back up there today and get this before the end of the month so you can have a commission check, um, I want it for this number now. And if you don't give it to me now, that's cool. That's great. I'm not in a rush, brother. I'm bringing cash money to the table. And here's the truth. Um, bankers don't really like cash money anymore because you know why? Car dealerships make money off of you actually financing now. Back in the t early 2000s, yeah, we can buy, we could trade in a car for 10000 and then mark it up to 18000 We could do that back then. But in today's market with the internet now, we can't do that. So now they're like, hey, if, if we trade it for ten thousand, okay, we could sell it for like maybe like twelve, like eleven five. But now they get a kick off of the percentage. So let's say for an example, if the interest rate is two percent, they mark it up to three percent. They get that that one percent markup. And I know the game, so that's why I'm like, no. What you're not going to do is mark up my interest rate. So you can pocket money and make a couple of grand, a few grand off of me on a car? No, no, no. This is if you offer the car for twenty five thousand, I give you twenty thousand, and I'm not financing. So you're not getting the markup, and you ain't getting this. 
Now, I'm going to start low knowing that they're not going to come that far, but I'm going to make sure that I, that I get there. What am I saying? I'm saving money. I want you to save money long term by saving in to pay cash. And what does that mean, man? Y'all, my very first car was a 1987 Nissan Maxima. From a 1987 Nissan Maxima paid for, given to me by my godparents, I went and got a Ford Explorer. That Ford Explorer cost me, I think it was like $8,800. Bought the Ford Explorer. From the Ford Explorer, I stepped out on my own, left my family. I went and bought me a Chevy Impala. Traded the Chevy Impala in for an Acura TL. Traded the Acura TL in for, at that time, a Nissan Maxima. Went from a Nissan Maxima. Uh, to a updated uh, Acura TL, went from Acura TL, drove that for almost 12 years, traded the Acura TL in for my first Porsche, got the Porsche, paid cash for the Porsche, traded that in when I totaled that, traded that one in for the Bentley. Got the Bentley, got the, uh, uh, the Range Rover, now I'm sitting good. And here's what I like. Both of my cars, if I really wanted to, I can make some money off of it. I can kind of get the money back on one of them because I really only drive one. I could put it on two row if I wanted to. I could turn it into a money machine for me and my family, my assets. What am I saying? We got to be in a position to where we are paying cash for the vehicles. I told my parents, um, I think they have one car note left. I told my dad, yo, get that done. And don't trade in any more cars. There's no need for it. Y'all are in your, you're about to hit the 60s. Yo, and no, my dad, my dad is in the 60s. My mom is in the 50s. I'm like, dad, you're in your 60s. You got a beautiful truck. Mama, you got, my mama got two cars. Um, both of her cars are paid off. My dad's other truck is paid off and he's paying off one more truck. After that, they'll be 100% debt free. And I'm like, yo, outside of their mortgage. And my goal is once I pay off my mortgage, right, I can go pay off my parents' mortgages. And so that way they have that freedom to just really enjoy life because they're in this bracket. And because my parents have been listening to me, my dad is making well more than $55,000 a year. He has more than $89,000 in his retirement. I think my dad is right at about $90,000 to $100,000 a year with just a mortgage payment and I think a $350 car note on his truck. That's it. I'm like, Dad, get rid of the truck. He said the truck would actually be paid off by the end of this year. I said, let's go. He got his retirement dream home. His his guess what his mortgage is? His mortgage is like right around like a thousand seventy five. That's below his 30 percent. That's not even twenty percent of his take home pay. But y'all, y'all want to have? We want to have the big things. We we want to have the big things. Now let's talk about food. Let, let's talk about food. Because we're going through the four things that that senior citizens, older people in their 65s and 70s are really, really hurting with, right? Let's talk about that. Um, um stop eating out, you guys. Stop, stop, stop eating out. Um, stop shopping while you're hungry. Um, um, Stop being too prideful to use coupons. Um, I walked in the other day to Giant, Giant grocery store, and I learned this from my mama. And uh, I, I, in my mailbox, I received these coupons. And they had uh, buy one, get one free uh, for 24 ounces of water. If I buy one, I get one free. And they had two coupons in there. And I was like, well, shoot. I got to get a lot of water. I might as well get two. And I started looking at all the coupons in there. I was like, okay, wait, I, 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 I get that. That's milk. Oh, man, that's eggs. Oh, shoot. Wait, what? That's soap? Man, listen, I became a couponer for the very first time. I walked in there with a bag. Man, I got the money. I got the money. And the part of me was like, man, if I got the money, I don't need no coupons. It's like, it's like we're ashamed to use coupons even though we don't need the coupons. I'm like, wait, 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 you're ashamed to get a discount? You're ashamed to spend less? Like you, because you got it, you want to spend it all? That is the dumbest thing you can possibly do. So now I'm like, before I even go to a grocery store and do grocery shopping, I know the time that coupons normally come in the mail and I've learned how to go to the specific store's website and to download coupons. And I'm a couponer. 
I'm saving me money. Because the more money I can save, it's not about being cheap, it's about being wise. And if I'm wise, the more money I save, the the more money I could put in my investments accounts, the more money I can invest back into my business, the more money I can invest up and save up for anything major that I wanna do, like a great vacation. Cause let me be real with you. While I'm sitting here telling y'all to be wise and frugal, I'm telling you to be wise and frugal in certain things so that way you can really ball out on the things that really have a benefit to you. And this last month, or July when I went on sabbatical. Y'all, I traveled. I spent the bag when I was traveling because I wanted to reward myself for a hard year. I wanted to enjoy my freedom, my free time of not working and resetting. I remember buying one-way tickets. And when I got there, if I wanted to leave, I would leave when I wanted to leave. Why? Because I've been a good steward. I've been wise. And I haven't been balling out like that. Man, when I go to, to, to Costco, when they got deals going on on bulk items, man, I go over there and I stack up. I got toilet tissue in my basement here to last me for days. I got tissue. I got Dove soap all around my house that lasts me for days. I don't have to buy Dove soap, tissue, or toilet paper, um, any cleaning supplies um, for at least, uh, yeah, yeah, for the rest of this year. Because I, I've learned how to shop in bulk. I'm not ashamed to be wise with my money. Watch this. I ain't spending money like that on dates. Man, TGI Friday, huh, I like it. Ruby Tuesdays, what's good? Texas Roadhouse, hello. I don't have to take no woman to know Ruth Chris every time we go. I only take nobody over there, man. Nah, man, listen. I'm trying to set myself up to win when I hit 6570. I'm trying to make sure that my wife, my kids, and I, as we get older, we're not, we're not in a position to where we have to exchange our time for money. No. 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 I refuse to do that. I refuse to do that. I refuse to do it. And here's the last thing that is, is blocking a lot of people. And I'm actually going to do a whole show on this particular item. And this is our health cost. This is how, how, how do we really take care of and position ourselves to win with health? If you are still working right now and your job offers health benefits, let's say you're in your 20s, let's say you're in your 30s. I want to encourage you to look into an HSA investment. An HSA is a health savings account that is attached to a high deductible account. So at this age of my life, even for myself, I'm only spending about $150 a month when it comes to health insurance. Here's the truth about my, my plan. Before I can tap into my health insurance policy, I'm responsible for the first $8,000. So when I went for my checkup in July, I think it was like close to $400 for my checkup. I spent $400. So now I'm responsible for another $7,600. If I go to the dentist, if I, not the dentist, if I go into the ER and that bill is $2,000, that comes off of my deductible of $8,000, I got to pay the $2,000 out of pocket. Some of y'all saying, man, that is a lot of money. No, Anthony. But if you practice what I've been teaching, set aside for emergencies. Have at least three to six months of expenses set aside for emergencies. That is your emergency fund. So when I go to the doctor, if I don't have extra money in my checking account, which for the most part, I do have extra money in my checking account, but let's just say if I didn't, I will pull that money for going to the doctor, going to the ER out of my emergency fund, and then I would replace the emergency fund. Because let's say, for an example, I think the average PPO plan is about, let's say, about $250 per paycheck. So that's $500 a month. $500 a month times 12, that's $6,000 a year. I'm only spending $150 a month times that by 12, that's $1,800 a year. So if I take the difference between that $1,800 and $6,000 and put that into my savings account, by next year, I got the $8,000 inside of my account in case something was to happen. You see what I'm saying? And you're saving money. 
And so once you get the that money inside of your savings account for your emergency fund, right, then what I tell people is take the rest of the money you would have invested into a PPO, put that inside of your HSA account. What, what is your HSA account? You know, it's, it's, it's simple. Think of your health savings account as it is literally that. You're saving money for all your health needs, tax-free. So this money comes out pre-tax. All right. So before you even get the check, they take the money out and they put it inside of your health savings account. And you can put, I think it's right around thirty six, thirty eight hundred dollars in for this year. If you're single, if you're above fifty five, you can put an extra one thousand dollars inside of it. And how do you use this account? Simple. If you got to go to the dentist, you can use it. If you got to get a prescription, you can use it. If you got to go to the doctor, you can use it. Anything that is attached to your health. You can use those funds for that tax free. And let's say if you if, if, like me, I've I'm always maximized out. Have I maxed it out for this year? Yes, I've already maxed my money out for this year. So what did I do? I actually told them leave five leave five thousand dollars inside of the account and invest the rest. Did you know you can invest the money inside of your HSA and get the compound interest off of that? So let's say, for example, you get to your 60s, and let's say you got $100,000, $200,000 in that account. You can use that money tax-free, let the government pay for your health needs, or you can withdraw the money out once you get past 62, 65 years old, and you will have to pay taxes on that. But there's no penalties if you want to spend it on anything else. So let's say you put... $20,000 in that over the next 10, 15 years, and it grows to $200,000, you can keep that $200,000 to cover all of your medical expenses, which I would advise you to do, or you can take it out and, and pay taxes on the money, and you can spend that money on anything that you want. But why are you spending $400, $500 a month on a PPO so you can have a low deductible of 20 bucks? But do the math. How often do you go to the doctor's office? If you're only going to the doctor's office, do your, your yearly checkup, ladies or brothers, and let's say you're only spending $1,000 a year out of, if you look at the bill, if it's only $1,000 for that year, but then you spent 12, you just wasted $11,000 because that money doesn't go over. It doesn't go over. So it doesn't make sense to have these high expensive medical um, uh, medical policies if you're healthy. Now, if you're not healthy in certain areas and, and, and you know for a fact you may have to go once a month, once every other month, maybe even max once a quarter, and that bill is five, ten thousand dollars every single time, then now it makes sense for you to be on a PPO. But for the majority of us watching right now, we don't have major health concerns. And here's what I like about it. As soon as I hit that eight thousand dollars out of um out of pocket, man, that thing kicks in full throttle and it takes care of me. So if a true emergency happened, they're gonna take care of me because I'm covered. I'm just gonna be responsible for whatever's left on my deductible. Okay, so listen, I, I want us to really take advantage of the health savings account. Here's the last thing too I want to talk about. Some of us get in these, these, these policies and what we don't do is we are not going inside of, we're not using the right doctor. We just show up at a hospital. We just show up at a physician. We just show up at a doctor and we never did the research to see if we are going to a doctor that's inside of our network. I'll be honest with you, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I didn't know, I need to see, okay, is this doctor in my network? Network meaning, once you have your insurance policy, you need to look up your insurance policy and to go to a doctor that's covered up underneath their network because as soon as you go out of your network, it can be almost double the price. So do the proper research, make sure that your doctors, your dentists, all that type of stuff is inside of your network to make sure, to make sure that you're saving money. I'm actually gonna do a whole show on the power of health savings accounts and how you can save, how you can invest and the, the right way to really look into a health savings account. So a health savings account has to be attached. You have to have a high deductible account. If you do not have a high deductible account, you cannot have a health savings account. And what I know about some companies, um, and I can't wait till I can get my company there, some companies will match the first whatever. 
right? So I know, and I know when I was at Ramsey Solutions, they matched the first five hundred or a thousand. I can't remember. I think it was the first five. Yeah, it was the first five hundred. So I put five hundred dollars in. They gave me five hundred dollars. It was a tax write off from, from the company to do that, and it benefit benefited them to to do that. Uh, so that means I had a thousand dollars in my health savings account. Man, I use that joint. I use my health savings account. I use it. And the money that I'm not using, I invest it. And I'm going to do a whole show on HSAs, high deductibles, and the power behind it, and who's right for this, and how can it help us save money. So listen, as we're ending this show today, I, I hope and I pray that, that you really understand the power that you have in front of you. Please do not get to the age of 65 and be like, dag on it, I wish. Dag on it, I wish. Dag on it, I wish. Now, before I make any purchase moving forward, I'm asking myself this one question. How is this going to impact me when I'm 65 or 70? Is it going to hurt me or is it going to help me? And sometimes, you know, me spending a lot of money on vacations, that's not going to help me at 65. But the next question is, okay, does it hurt me? No, because you're still able to invest. You're investing what you should be investing into. And we still do have to enjoy where we are today. I still want us to enjoy where we are today. But at the end of the day, you guys, what are we doing to set us up in the future? That's my question. That's what I want you all to think about. What excuses are blocking you from getting to where you want to be at at 65 and 70? This year, we got to stop with those excuses. You got to stop now. I really wish that people will understand this. You want to change, but you don't want to spend 12 months to make the change. So you'll rather be in the same place or the worst situation in the next 12 months rather than being uncomfortable for 12 months to change the next 12 months, the next 12 years. You got a, you got a, you got an option. You can complain for the next 24, 36, next 12 years, or you can complain for 12 years because it's uncomfortable, but you know there's a change coming. And if that's you, check out the information in today's show notes. Let's not be a part of this statistic. I love you all. God bless you. And I'll see you in the next show. Peace out.